Okay, so this is just kind of a general overview of everything we've worked on up to this point, uh, kind of some of the other things that uh, wanted to show the backers and just kind of show off that we've been working on um, from the beginning even to up until this point. So just want to start. Um, so this is kind of a progress report we're doing. Oh, he is wanting to get back in. All right, cool. Let me start the beginning with John. Okay. Hey, John, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Oh, cool. awesome. Sorry for losing you. Um, is it okay if we re record this portion? Um, and we'll share it with the other backers, too. In our experience, we'll, we'll get momentum over time as we share these design inflections and opportunities for feedback, for feedback but we want to make sure you're okay with that. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, well, um, we'll go ahead and record it, and, and Robert will share our work today and update. And we're really excited to hear what you think about your Gigabyte X. Okay. Cool. So um, this is kind of just a general overview. Um, it's the Gigabot X progress. We're going to go over some of the stuff we started working on, kind of our original design. Uh, I have some videos. Videos probably not going to work super well, but I have some of the early uh, progress stuff that y'all didn't get to see that I didn't see in the Kickstarter campaign. So I just want to show you some of the cool videos we had, um, as well as just kind of what the issues were with that design, how we're going to re rectify that situation, how we're going to make it better. Um, so this is the original Kickstarter design. Uh, you can see, you probably recognize that slice view from the uh, campaign. Um, we have the motor, NEMA 23, uh, hopper, heating system, uh, our normal screw, um, as well as the nozzle. So we're looking at two different types of nozzles. This one, uh, the design you see here is the one with the removable nozzle. Uh, currently on our design, we're looking at just a one piece as well as we are evaluating that a little. Um, this is actually uh, one of the first prints we did on the Gigabot X. Um, let's see if it'll even load. Um, no, I can do it. Uh, so one of the things, like, we had uh, our original print. You've probably seen a picture of it. Um, it happened about 10 o'clock at night uh, while we were wrenching away, trying to get this silly thing to work um, for the first time. Finally got it working. We're super excited. So this was the video. I sent everyone at the company when we did that. Um, we also had a first large print, which was a trash can. Um, you can also see that on the uh, on the thing. Um, video is just not working today, so didn't wasn't expecting much, but you know, got showed. Um, so it was uh, we did a large trash can. Uh, both were made, both were with uh, Virgin PLA. Um, it was just an easy material we had lying around that we had tested before on uh, like filament makers and stuff. So we knew it was a good starting point. Um, so this was the original design. Um, it was a good starting point. It was modular. Uh, do, uh, do the quality of 3D printing components. Um, so basically we were trying to see like, we were figuring out a lot about the hopper. We were figuring out a lot about like how much space we needed on the bot. We were figuring out a lot of things. So what we were doing was we were 3D printing as many parts as we could to try to keep it modular, to kind of try to be able to change it. Um, it's a lot quicker for us to 3D print, as you probably guess, we're a 3D printing company, so we have lots of 3D printers, um, than it is to get stuff machined. We do have an in-house machine shop, but still turnaround times for machine parts can sometimes be kind of long. So we were just trying to, uh, to be able to quickly iterate and um, change things. But what we learned, there were certain parts we were designing that were 3D printed, that just shouldn't be 3D printed. Um, there's a lot of force and a lot of stress that goes into this um, machine, as well as like heat creep. And there's a lot of different things that we didn't account for that we learned a lot about um, in our first design. Um, one of the first issues was hopperware. Um, basically, when it would rotate, when the screw would rotate, it would um, move the pellets around in a circular motion. And what this would cause is if there was any free space in the hopper design, um, it would actually wear a channel due to the friction against the, uh, the polycarbonate we were using on the hopper, as well as um, just like uh, if there was any spot, it would wear a hole into it. And so our hoppers had like limited life. So we could probably get, uh, I'd say like 50, 60 hours on the bot. Before. And that's, that's being generous before the hopper would wear. And it depended on the material and depended on the time. Um, we'd also get delamination. And um, if somehow the fans that were on the heat sink got turned off it would also melt and pull the heat uh the heat set inserts out of the part um as well as one of the issues we ran into 
right now, linear rails are kind of difficult to get, actually. Um, we've been having to go through about three or four different suppliers uh, to get linear rails because there's a shortage of them right now. Our original supplier, I think, said gave us a quote of 1.45 weeks to get a set of rails for one of these bots. Um, so, oh man, so the new design, um, some of the features, it's a full metal body, it's a modular hopper, it des um, it's designed to allow users to easily modify it um, for different feed methods. Uh, it's just a screw and bolt on attachment. Um, that's uh, instead. Oh, we got another one going. Oh. Uh, Hello. Um, so uh, some of the features. Oh, sorry, uh, Robert. You know, my, uh, who's this joining? Ah, uh, you're muted. Let me. Yeah. It says Zaid. Um, Oh hi, Zaid. This is this is Samantha. It's been it, wow, it's been almost a year since we've seen each other. Um, Robert is about uh, just started the presentation on um, Gigabot X and the issues they've encountered and progress to date. We're we're recording it if it's okay with you. So um, we'll send you the recording afterwards so you can miss the part or you can catch up on anything that you may have missed and ask questions. Um, but I think you're muted right now. Just as a heads up, um, so Robert, if you want to jump back in. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, this was a um, this is our new design. Uh, so what we're working on is we're working on a full metal body. Um, a lot of the issues we had were with the body that we had done previously because it was 3D printed. Um, it was very susceptible to heat and distress, and uh, it was wearing out way quicker than we were comfortable with uh, ever releasing to a general user. Um, so we decided uh, probably the best route was to just make it out of aluminum, try to get it um, as strong as possible uh, so it wouldn't it wouldn't wear out basically. Um, again, we have a modular hopper. Um, we have a lot of people who are very interested in uh, different ways. Um, I've had backers and stuff and a lot of people talk to me about different ways to uh, feed it, uh, either via gravity, uh, having an external hopper, or having a dryer or something like that. We want it to be able to have a modular option. We want it to be able, you can unscrew this really quickly, be able to bolt on the new one and keep going. Um, this is supposed to be something simple. Um, so we wanted that to be an easy option. If we're going to say it's open source, I want it to also be easy for the user to hack. I feel bad if I say it's open source and it's not. Um, we also uh, have a new screw design. Uh, you may not see much of a difference, but it's there. Um, it's, as you can see, it's a little bit longer. Um, we added some length to the screw. Uh, we wanted to increase the channel depth, um, the, the, the channel width from the original. Um, we were noticing the screw we were using um, couldn't really contain that many pellets when it started to feed, so we were trying to get a little bit more of a containment area. Um, the one we had originally didn't follow too well on the uh, screw design uh, parameters, so we were like, oh, let's modify it a little bit. Um, we also added a little, um, we also changed the compression ratio. We were finding the compression ratio we felt was a little bit too high for what we were doing, so we reduced it down a little bit. Um, it went down from 2 to a 1.7. Um, we added about an inch, uh, 1.875 inches from the original screw, as well as there was a hopper opening redesign. Um, from the first design, we learned a lot as well as um, we've done a lot of reading into the first design, um, but we've had more time to do even more research and learn a lot about uh, pellet extrusion design and hopper design and all that stuff. So uh, one of the big things we found is there's actually a lot of research saying that if you have a certain width past that width, um, it's a little bit over the diameter of the screw. Past that, you're not going to get much more fed into, the, uh, fed into the screw. So what we're trying to do as we were trying to, uh, we didn't want to have all that space taken up by something that's not necessary. So we just changed the opening, uh, modified it a little bit, so it's uh, so it's a bit better. Um, the other thing we're working on, um, 
So from a neural gigabot, um, we're using a NEMA 23 motor with a planetary. Um, our original board uh, will not provide the current we think necessary to run this. I mean, we probably could, but we don't feel like it would be um, the experience we want. So what we've done is we're working on um, using an external motor driver on our current AzTX3 Pro. And we want it to just have um, a breakout board that we can drop in, easily wire it to improve the, uh, the setup from the original prototype. Uh, the original prototype, we just had some soldered on jumper pins, which I don't feel like y'all would, impre uh, would impress y'all very much or be a very finished product. And I feel really bad sending that out. So what we're working on is a better solution to uh, kind of get that hooked up and wired up in the bot. Um, and we're working on a better wiring si system than our original, so we can have it easily swapped if you got a retrofit or even uh, if you need to maintain it or something, it will be very easy for you to uh, pull apart and work on. Um, so some of the design considerations, um, hopper placement, vibration issues, and uh, maintenance considerations were taken in as well for this. Um, one of the big things is, uh, thankfully for this um, hopper placement, uh, it's a little bit better with this and we can kind of adjust it. We're also talking about evaluating, putting it on the side and changing up the design a little bit so we can have a little bit less of a footprint. Um, with this current design, um, we are taking up a little bit of space trying to uh, get it. Uh, we want to try to give you as much X and Y travel as possible, but the extruder is getting a little bit bigger. Um, so we're going to have to sacrifice some of that, but we're trying to get as much of that back as possible. And one of the big things is if the hopper sticking out the front or something like that, we're actually losing travel in the Y direction. So we're trying to consider that, um, vibration issues. Um, there were some issues, uh, you know, we want to make sure vibration problems. Let me say adding people back to the call. Um, did you, we just get another participant. Uh, it's John, uh, keeps dropping on and off. <laughs> uh, I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'm glad our internet's working well here today. So, um, <laughs> vibration issues. Um, since we have such a, a nozzle sticking out so far, we are considering it. And one of the big things is, is we're, um, our firmware currently is accounting for it with accelerations and stuff like that. So our current prints have not shown any like severe amounts of um, resonance or anything on them uh, that would uh, make the print look bad or would cause any uh, fouling of the print. Um, so we've been doing a lot of testing on that to make sure that our uh, both our firmware and our profile will account for anything like that and we'll make sure that our hardware is also as secure as possible. We're, um, we're beefing it up. We have actually four blocks uh, supporting currently the um, there are four uh, linear rail blocks holding up the X carriage, as well as there are four blocks on the Y carriage. It's a little bit overkill, but we're fine with that if we have. Um, uh, currently, we're testing. This is our new assembled bot. We're starting to put together the second unit right now um, that we're going to be putting the new pellet extruder on. Um, we're getting parts by the day. Um, and we've been mocking up assemblies. We have, we've been, uh, we're getting parts machined in house, and that right now is um, what we're waiting on. We've had to get new tooling for this. Um, surprisingly, when you make a large uh, pellet extruder, um, and we've been just a normal filament company, we've we're lacking a couple of the tools and stuff that uh, we needed to get everything set up. So um, we're getting those in right now, getting the parts finalized. We've almost completely wired the bot. Um, we're doing final cabling on it. Uh, we've gotten the new cable chains designed. We've gotten all of that done. Um, and once it's done, we'll be uh, starting testing. Some of the things we're testing, um, to say when we just keep saying we're testing, um, materials testing. Uh, we're trying to improve our current profiles. We have some really great profiles right now, and we are able to produce like decent prints but we want to have better profiles. We want this to be almost as good of an experience as using a normal gigabot or even just like, we want it to be on par with using a normal gigabot. So we're trying to get our profiles as good as possible. Um, uh, testing materials. We want to test 
as many materials as we possibly can. The two big ones we're focused on right now are PLA and PETG or PET. We're doing PETG, we're doing normal PET, we're doing virgin as well as recycled and composites. We actually have some carbon fiber PET, I think, here at the office, as well as we're looking at some recyclable versions as well as just virgin material. Um, we know some people are really interested in the recycling aspect as well as other people aren't really don't really care about that and they just want to use uh, virgin materials. Um, the other things we're working on, uh, continuous improvements, we're working on pellet feeding. Uh, we've talked about doing a gravity fed system or we're also trying to get a dryer in house so we can work on a vacuum fed system with an actual industrial dryer for pellets. So we can start seeing how it would look if we wanted to put an industrial dryer that normally is used to make filament and dry the pellets before putting it into a filament making machine for like an industrial scale. What if we scaled that down and give that to the user in house? If we could have a drying system that directly attaches to this, stuff like that. Um, we're testing our new extruder screw. Um, we currently have it on order and it should be in soon. Um, it's a bolt in comparison from the original screw. So it should be a quick tweak and we're going to start testing it, see if it changes our profiles, how it's going to affect things. Do we like it or do we not? Do we want to go back to our original design? So we're working on stuff like that as well, um, as well as we're also evaluating the smaller nozzle. Um, we did a couple of small prints on it. Um, we never got to the point where we did a lot of testing on it. And we really like to before we make that like, you know, an option or something like that, because that's something we are considering in the background. Because the biggest question I get every time people see the pellet extruder is, well, how detailed can it go? And I know that's probably a concern with everyone who's backing as well. They want to know how detailed is, can this pellet extrusion get? So um, we're trying to be able to get down there, but we want to make sure we have the support and the backing for it. And we're not going to do something that won't work or something like that. As well as we're also working on new firmware. Um, to build a pellet extrusion bot, the normal Marlin won't cut it. We've been using an older version of Marlin recently to test it um, that we had modified and hacked, but it's a little bit behind date and we don't feel comfortable with that. We want you to have the newer version. We're trying to keep it on par with the Gigabot firmware. So we actually have a um, intern this summer who's uh, been helping a lot with firmware. He's a soft, he's an electrical and software guru, I guess is the best way to put it. And he's um, he's been helping us with that. We're actually going to try to be implementing one of the big things we have in our bots is we do filament changes. We have all that. We're going to try to make it to where if you have to change pellets, it will be the easiest process ever. So we're going to have a pellet changing set up. We're going to try to make like we're going to try to add all those features that normal printers have into them, but have it for the pellet extrusion system. So um, eventually we're going to have uh, um, Eventually, we'd like to have some sort of pellet runout system. That's way off in the future. I can't say that that's something we're evaluating quite yet, but we do want to have it. And we're looking at how we could implement it into the system with a feed system on the side of the bot or something along those lines, as well as we're also looking at linear advance. If you don't know, uh, one of the big things that was a new update to Marlin was what's called linear advance. And it um, accounts for curves and stuff like that. If you've ever seen a, a square print, when it hits the corners, it looks kind of round and bubbled out, which is not good because uh, it's just back. It's just the change in pressure and the change in motion. So what they're doing is they're now accounting for that with extrusion. So what we're going to start doing is we're actually going to implement that in the pellet extruder. And what we've seen with the bigger nozzles on printers and like the larger size uh, prints is that's a very super useful feature that produces really nice looking prints. So we're also going to try to see what would that look like if we implemented it into the pellet extruder and how we're going to get that to function alongside the pellet extrusion system. So we're evaluating that right now as well. Um, and uh, right now uh, he's starting to write the code and uh, we'll be testing with our old code. And then once it's ready, which if you'd like to see the old code or any of the uh, CADs, I'll probably be posting uh, some of the newer CADs on the GitHub soon, as well as um, we'll be, uh, we have all the old CADs on the GitHub as well as the firmware and anything, if you'd like to take a look. Um, I can make sure a link gets out to y'all, or we can make sure a link gets out to y'all if y'all are interested in seeing some of that stuff and taking a look at it for yourself. Um, we're also uh, part of an NSF SBIR grant um, with the pellet extrusion system where we're doing testing uh, for our profiles. So currently they're actually testing the prototype machine, one of our prototype machines to improve our printing profiles. Um, when we built this, um, it was, uh, we had, we were very excited and we did a lot of tuning. We got it to where we were getting very consistent prints. 
but it was not where we were a point where we were like um stoked on you know like the quality we're using uh we wanted to get better and better and better um what this has allowed us this partnership is they're actually they're having students all they're doing is focusing on the profiles um they've actually been developing a jura profile too so if you're not a simplify 3d user uh we'll actually probably have a cura profile for it as well as well as they're figuring out um kind of like uh, the quirks and things that they're learning about how to change profiles for pellet extrusion. So we can actually implement that into Simplify and have a better profile from it. So that's been super, super useful as well as they're also doing tensile testing. Um, and what they're finding is actually our tensile, their dog bone pull tests, um, they're getting uh, equivalent strength uh, from our pellet extrusion system as they were getting with the normal uh, printer system. So we're losing no strength in our system when we're actually printing with these materials, as well as um, they're actually thinking that layer adhesion is better. They're currently working on a solution on how to uh, quantify that, but um, hopefully we'll be hearing back from them uh, about that. And hopefully we'll be able to get that data out to y'all too. So y'all can kind of see uh, what their testing has shown and what it's proved to us. Um, so what's next? Um, we're, we're, we're building two units. Uh, we're actually going to be building a three, two, uh, to test, uh, to verify the new extruder design and make any changes that are necessary. Um, we're also uh, using that information. We'll be finalizing the design and begin manufacturing. What we want to do is we want to make sure our design is robust and can be like used in a daily environment before we send you anything. We don't want it to be just like a bad experience for you. This is this is re three D. We very much care about uh, the quality of our printers. Um, if you haven't used one of our printers before, we really, really want it to be a good user experience. So we're going to take the time to make sure that happens. Um, so those are the next kind of things we're working on and what we're ramping up towards. Um, we're focused on getting uh, getting a good design out. And uh, as we as we make progress, we'll definitely be updating on that. Um, so if you all have any questions, I'd love to answer any questions you have. Um, we had a couple of people ask some questions, send us emails asking questions, but if y'all had any in person, we'd love to address them. Okay. I guess. Um, it's not you, you know, if you're online, I know that you've, you're probably, you've most recently shared some um, feedback uh, is there anything that you'd like to just, uh, explore uh, real time? And then just for context, there is another backer on the call. Uh, we had four. I know it's tricky with the timing. We'll be feeling that out. Um, maybe coming up with a better option going forward. But um, if, if you're on and, and you're comfortable, we, we'd love to hear your feedback. Samantha, we can come up nice with a hear your voice again. Nice, nice to say hi. Um, the thing is, I, I got somewhere late, so I'm not sure if um, most of what I asked in the email was already addressed. But yeah, uh, pretty much what, what I said was explained, for example, the gravity hopper being changed by this modular hopper. But I don't know if that um, you guys will be selling those modules or you um, it, you will be releasing CAD files for you to print them and then use them, stuff like that. Sure. So um, before Robert drops in, you know, this is, uh, <laughs> as, as we all know, printing from garbage is really hard, one. Um, two, making a pellet printer is, is interesting because <laughs> very quickly we recognize that um, the need for coming up with a system to feed large volumes of pellets, um, in addition to a drying system and a grinding system, we, you know, that that's something that the the WeWork Award is helping us explore on our own time, and and we're hoping that this National Science Foundation um, grant could help us further that um, at a commercial scale. So. Your gigabot um, may not have a larger feeding system, but we know that you know if you're looking at printing from pellets at scale, it's, it's necessary, um, and and we're quickly prioritizing um, that add-on. 
Um, I, I like your idea of a gravity, gravity feeding system. Originally, when, when it was just me and Matthew, you know, over beer thinking about this, we were talking about having, say, like a 55-gallon drum that was sucking pellets in. But the gravity feeding system makes a ton of sense, known it independently. Um, Robert, I'd love your thoughts on it. So, we've, yeah, we've evaluated this before. Like, I already have some models in place for this. So it's something we've considered, like, moving forward completely. Um, as far as having something implement, implemented yet or tested, I don't have it. Um, once we get this machine up and running, hopefully that will be something we will be uh, testing quite quickly and trying out because this machine eats pellets when it has a big nozzle. It loves going through a lot of pellets very quickly, which is great for making giant prints. Um, but it... Uh, something definitely that needs to be considered as far as files i absolutely want to release files so i mean if you find out a solution before i do like um or before we do i want you to have every tool necessary to be able to uh take what we've worked on and modify it this is supposed to be an open source project and like i'm samantha can probably attest i'm, I'm a little bit nuts when it comes to open source so i believe like definitely you need those files to uh to work on that kind of stuff. So, um, so to kind of address that, yeah, we're definitely considering overhang because it's a, definitely a more affordable cost than any sort of vacuum feeding or anything yeah. like that. Um, we do want to offer a more industrial option too, eventually down the road if we can do as well. But um, yeah, just hanging is one of the things we've been, we already have the hopper design and we actually are looking at uh, using uh, the CPAP sleeping machines like the uh, using one of those hoses because they're super flexible we're kind of evaluating what that would look like mounted on the machine yeah maybe the only problem that we could have like if, if you have the pellets hanging up there as i suggested in, in the email it's that it maybe will uh, help with the vibrations of the machine because uh, if, if it goes by side to the hopper design as, as been in the kickstarter campaign um it's already, it's already long and and even if it's well if it's on top it will make it vibrate even more and if it's on the center uh, aside from the linear from the linear rail that i'm pretty happy to see maybe it will also cause vibration and that's something i was super worried about actually what the second topic in, in my list because um if you only have a plate Maybe if you don't if you don't have some sort of brackets to the upper and, and lower tip of the extruder, the vibration will will cause problems. I actually have a gigabit too, and I swapped the extruder for a Volcano on a 3D, and even then you can feel the vibrations and you can see it in reflected in in the quality of the prints. Yeah. No, definitely. We, we want to address that and make sure that uh, it's mechanically sound and definitely getting more of the pellet off the box up is definitely the right way to go. So we're definitely going to address that as quickly as possible. Also, this was a constant idea, but maybe throwing in an inductive sensor since you already have the metal bed. And that, that could let you to introduce a firmware routine for calibration, which could be very helpful because you have this 82 centimeters long diagonal in the center of the bed, and, and it, it tends to need recalibration, at least in my system, which has an end stop for the seed. It's controlled by a screw and some x -mods. Uh, they tend to move with vibration, and you need to recalibrate seat height pretty much every print. And also, when you take off large prints from the bed, you always need to recalibrate it before printing again. And with some sort of live seat access uh, firmware calibration, that will be helped with an inductive sensor. Maybe that will help. I know it's an extra. I'm not like requesting it. It's just an idea for for you to take in case you like it. Um. Yeah, actually, uh, I think one of the things uh, we have a wish list for our firmware guy. Uh, we're definitely all hardware people here, and like we like having amazing hardware, but we've always kind of struggled on the firmware side. Okay. Um. One of the wish list things we gave him. Uh. He. Uh. We're looking at inductive bed leveling already. 
So it probably won't be like very soon um, on this model, but I think it's something we're definitely evaluating because um, we realized that leveling the beds on this is kind of difficult. Um, I have seen from uh, like our bot with this one, um, with the larger nozzle, bed leveling wasn't as terrible as it is sometimes with uh, some of the point four and stuff like that. So um, it is a little bit better, but it, it doesn't be a uh, inductive sensor. So we are already looking at that. Um, it probably won't be on. Uh, it, I'm not going to like I wouldn't say it would be on the bot that would be released anytime soon, but hopefully it will be on the road we are considering. So already I mean, evaluating. Also, speaking about firmware, uh, I know my version is the oldest one, so I'm not sure if this has already changed, but the routine when you pump the access causes collision on the extruder if you still don't have the right seed height. For example, when you hum, it first go to the to hum the X and Y axis, then it moves it, but then it moves again the X and Y axis, like to rectify the, their hum. But in that movement, the tip of the extruder pretty much every time clashes with the hotbed. So changing the, the routine in the firmware for when you home the access, especially with this super long tip and you know it's just the tip I, I think it will bend differently to other extruders that may just I don't know break the PLA or ABS part. This time since it's all metal it could be a problem. Yeah um, I think our, our firmware has changed a little bit on that situation. I know at least the new one doesn't do the, the jump back like the old one did before it starts. Um, it, also, uh, it actually drops the bed, I think, before it does X and Y now. So it's kind of a little bit different how it uh, does its homing routine on for the normal GB. And um, we'll probably have something very similar for this one. Yeah, we don't want anything crashing, um, especially with this big of an extruder. When it crashes, it has a little bit more of an impact than um, the previous version does. Amazing. Also, I have this idea on the mass center of the extruder. Uh, since I don't have it, I, I don't know if, if my ideas are correct, but I think the, uh, the center of gravity of the extruder is way on top of the linear rail. So maybe adding some sort of weight in the lower part will help to prevent the jerking from being sent to somewhere else in the machine, in this case, the x-axis. It's just an idea. Yeah, um, we haven't fully evaluated the uh, mass center of it. Like, I have the model. I just haven't put in materials and evaluated mass center yet. Um, it is a little bit higher. Um, so we may have to look at something like that. Yeah, that is a good idea. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you. And I think, oh, the other thing I, I, I wrote about was about um, good maintenance to the extruder, but I see that you already addressed that and you're working on it. So I, I don't actually have ideas. I only um, ask for, like, if you could have a part in the top of the machine for easy access without it being on top of the bed, like, as it happens on, on older gigabot models, so that will be great. Um, sorry, could you repeat that? No. No. Could you repeat that one more time? Sorry, I'm just oh. trying to try it right. Maybe it was my internet. I, I was saying that about maintenance, it would be great if you could have a design space for you to be able to move the extruder to give it service to, to give maintenance without it being on top of the bed. Because on all the gigabit models, that's really complicated. Uh, when you try like to stop the extruder, you need to move it to a specific position where 
it's still hard to access those parts to give it service. With this new experience, it will be a lot harder. Maybe like giving a little more extra on the X or Y axis for it to be placed not on top of the web and, and, and being accessible will be great. Um, Robert, for, for context, Saeed has a very old Gigabot from one of the early generations. Okay, um, yeah. So some of the enhancements we may have already made for GD3 Plus are, are probably included, um, but, but that's what he's referencing. Okay, yeah, no, no. Oh, really cool. it's I have a valid question. Um, we'll take a look at that. Um, I think last time when we did it, um, it did go off the bed a little bit. Um, but the thing we we'll do is we can set up a function or something where we can go into maintenance mode and it'll drop the bed like super far down. We can probably make something along those lines. I know sometimes, especially with such a long extruder, it's kind of a pain to get access to stuff. Uh, the last one, I would say in comparison to one of the GB2s or even the GB3, um to get uh to maintenance it was a lot simpler um just because of sheer size and just how it's set up um it was a lot easier to access parts on it than uh some of the other models i would say. maintenance is actually surprisingly a little bit easier the only thing that's kind of a little bit of a fight is if you're having to uh pull the screw out and then um if we have to do that i would definitely say we'd probably send you uh we probably have some decent instructions or at least a good video about that too as well so um but yeah no we'll definitely look at maintenance position either it'll be something we can work on in firmware or we'll see if there's an open spot on the printer where that would be a good option for amazing i didn't know that and also i heard you have problem dehydrating the pellets uh, i actually had a lot of problem when trying to print nylon but what we did is that we purchased this food dehydrator it's like something you can get on Amazon and it works really well. Like it, it's supposed to be for food, but after that, we've got perfect nylon prints without any problem. Maybe, I don't know. I, I, I think we should already consider that, but just wanted to point that out because it's actually how we solve our problem. Yeah. Um... We, we got one of the little dehydrators to help a little bit. Um, what we're finding too is uh, it goes through so many pellets though <laughs> that we're uh, running out of space in the dehydrator. Okay. So we're evaluating some other options for that as well. Um, one of the big things is the pellets, you definitely have to dry them. Um, and it's a little bit, ev it's even more temperamental than like just printing with like nylons and stuff would be if you don't dry the pellets right on certain materials. Like PLAs, ABSs, PETGs, we haven't seen that issue a lot. But like with, um, I think we were doing acetate. That was that was the one that it was it was really temperamental. We had to do a lot of drying before we were able to print with it. And certain other materials that we were testing, um, you do definitely have to dry. Um, eventually, looking at an industrial solution that would be like kind of uh, a part of or like very close that could hold a large amount of pellets for the user. But um, until then, yeah, we may have to figure out, uh, we are looking at something like a dehydrator. Um, we, we've been using one previously, um, and I think we're probably gonna continue using it until we get something a little bit more industrial. Sure, I'm uh, Yeah, um, but we'd like to find a better, like, it, like the dehydrator is a great, great start. Like, and yeah, I totally agree. It's like yeah, I know you person. guys need like an industrial solution, something that you can like ship for the machine to feel professional, right? Like, and and it's not even, yeah, them give that feel to the consumer, to the final consumer. I I totally get it. But yeah, it's, it's a good start. Yeah, um, the issue is too is it's going through about if you don't, if you aren't aware, we're putting upwards like we can get up to two pounds of pellets per hour. Super so, yeah, it's really, really fast. And so we're trying to figure out a way where we can dry that much material quickly. It, it doesn't even have to be an industrial solution. We just really want something that like we can keep up with our own printer, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Like yeah. we design something that can print so quickly and go through so much filament that quickly that it's it's with something we didn't really, I think, imagine at that point. Because it takes like two hours to dry a, a set of pellets. 
with one yeah. of these. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did find, um, we're talking with me, I think it's PET was like 45 minutes for a drying time. And it's doing, it can do up to 15 pounds an hour right now is their current solution. So I think we're looking at one, something like that. But I think we're also talking about like, what would it look like if we could make it a little bit smaller and not as crazy. So hopefully that'll be something that you'll hear more about in the future. So um, we're trying to cover all our bases here because we just, we originally thought if, man, if we have the hardware, uh, the other stuff will come, but we're learning that's not really the case. And we're trying to cover that now. <laughs> so. Yeah. And finally, regarding uh, Samantha asking her email, which materials will we like to be working with in with this new pilot extruder? We'd love to have a uh, profile for POM and Prolipopulin. That would be great. I know these are materials with high contraction and that are normally hard to to print. Uh, now that you have compression ratios and stuff like that, I know it will be tough, but I think it's 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 doable. That will be like our Santa wish list. Okay. Uh, you said polypropylene and Tom. Tom is a variation of nylon mixed with other compounds. Pretty okay. much things that uh, if used primarily in industrial lines for printing gears that are gear resistant. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, definitely, um, we actually have a group I think is trying polyethylene right now. Um, so we're trying to get closer to those materials. They are seeing a lot of pull up. I'm trying to figure out like, what would the solution look like to get that to work because yeah definitely the contraction is a huge issue with that stuff mental okay. so but we definitely see there's a lot of a recycled in that range and be like it's a material that a lot of people want to use and if we get to what the hell is that'd be awesome Mexico is actually quite big on recycling. We are supposed to recycle pretty much 60% of the PET we generate every year. And polypropylene is the country. The country, the whole country, like from all wow, the PET huge. we generate. Yeah, I know, it's, it's, it's amazing. And the second more recycled plastic is polypropylene. That's great to hear. Yeah, and also already have a big industry on recycling in Mexico, like really big, um, a lot of politicians. Anything, anything you have on that would be really helpful for us. Yeah, sure. And if if you want, I don't know, some sort of introductions or whatever here, we can help you with that. Sure, we love Mexico. I'm gonna. <laughs> In fact, yeah. um, I'll, I'll, as you know, offline, Morgan might be coming down to capture some customer stories, so it would be a good time. Yeah, sure. And also, you can go to the new building. I, I hope for the time we, we have already moved from our office here in Condesa to, to the new four plants building. That'd be so great. Um, I, uh, John, if you're still on, I'd love to hear what materials you really want us to focus on and any questions that you have. Oh no, I can't hear him. Can anyone else? Um, I'm not seeing. Oh, here he comes. Let's see if. Hey, John. Oh, there he comes. We were wondering if you uh, had any. We were wondering if you had any preferences on materials you'd like us to focus on for testing, or anything you'd be interested in printing with. Well, I'm new to 3D printing. I'm looking for everything to different strength plastics to transparent plastics. Okay. So this is an adventure of mine, and my biggest concern is whether it prints one material, which I can work with, 
or it also a suspension material. If it's a one point five, I just don't know. Uh, right now, uh, our pellet extruder, uh, we're focusing on one material. If you, okay. um, if you don't know, there's a thing called, uh, when they do uh, colored plastics, they do what's called a master batch, which are these special type of pellets that you mix in with the, uh, the main color, and it dyes it. So what we learned uh, with some of our original prints is we can actually change that color throughout the print. You can feed into the hopper and it will actually change the color throughout the print. And it's a little bit hard to control, but um, if you want to, you can do like giant multicolored prints. So we printed a uh, uh, American flag th uh, themed uh, like basket thing. So it was like red, white, and blue. Um, we've, we can do like a bunch of different colors and it's really, really cool how easy it is to change that. Um, the better part is you need one color of uh, pellet like a one main color of pellets and you add a little bit of whatever color you want. It's uh, it's by weight ratio. I don't remember the exact rate ratio. I can't quote you on that, but um, yeah, which is really cool. Well, I'm looking forward to as much information about the printers that I can get because I have plans to modify the printer based on its capabilities. Okay. Yeah, um, right now, uh, all of our uh, files are currently available on GitHub, as well as our firmware even. Uh, as we update our files, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully be sending out some information to our backers, as well as if you just follow us. Um, we want as much of this to be open source as possible. Uh, we want this to help as many people as possible. So um, you should be able to take the files and modify it how you please, change what you want, add what you want. Um, I even post some of my files of my failures and old revisions. So you give you some inspiration. Uh, we were working on some weird changes, one of which looked like if we mounted a normal pellet head next to the um, next to the, the pellet extruder. So like what if we had a normal like filament print and pellet extruder together? So wow. I yeah we actually posted I actually if you go online right now I think it's actually already online on GitHub. Um, we have those files for download if you want to if you want to check out. I certainly do. Thank you. I'll be, I've been back and forth. I'll be very interested in looking at the slides for this presentation. Okay. I'm done. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then I know we're we're coming up on our time here. Um, we heard this question in the Kickstarter survey. I had to be careful because Kickstarter is um, they want to ensure you're not asking anything marketing related. But what we saw from 100% of the people that um, purchased a Gigabot X for its derivation was that they were interested in training or an enclosure or some other add-on. Uh, for both of you on the call, I just, you know, that, that's, a, that's um, further development we want to prioritize as we, as we work on your units, um, particularly while we have some of our summer interns. Um, in, in terms of feature requests or, or, or additional features that you might want, I was just curious to hear what you would like us to focus on. So um, for context, the, the priority that we saw from the initial touch over the Kickstarter reward survey was that um, several of you would like an enclosure or a wheeled platform. Is there anything else you want us to work on? Zaid, you indicated, you know, uh, <laughs> a feeding mechanism that's affordable and, and as simple as possible would be ideal. Is there anything else? Yeah, Sam, I think as, as you said in, in the last pitch that I saw from you, maybe trying to get the whole solution all together. I know there are already shredders on the market but if you have yours and you could sell like a full package with your shredder your dehydrator and you know it, it, then you could have like whole solution to to make the full cycle of producing using recycling like shredding dehydrating getting into the machine again and, and printing something else i think that's that's a good idea like because if you could like purchase a, a full package from you, maybe 
I don't know clients will respond. I will. I, I will purchase the, the whole solution together. Yeah, um, so you, we might interview you offline. We're trying to get requirements right now for a grinder. Um, it's John, for context, you know, I think when we came up with the idea for a 3D printer to print from plastic waste, which is what drove us to the, the pellet printer solution, um, I think we had this assumption that there was like a miniaturized and affordable grinder on the market or a feeding mechanism as well as a grinder, so something that could shred for the, those customers that are interested in, say, using recycled water bottles or, or polypropylene, they could shred the plastic into a, like a standard flake. And what we learned um, in our research, and thanks to Robert, you know, as the intern over the years and, and grew up with our team is that, and we, we interviewed other users in similar situations that could benefit from this, is um, grinders are really expensive and they're really big. Um, so what Zaid is referring to is, is this gap in the market to maybe come up with something that would allow you to make uniform flake or uniform pellets. Um, we're also finding, um, just for full transparency, um, in our research with Michigan Tech University as they validate our prototypes, is when they source pellets from multiple vendors, sometimes the pellet size is not as uniform as they claim. Um, yeah. So there might be a need to run it through something. Um, so yeah, Zaid, that, that's something we're thinking about. We've we've shared this um, finding with the National Science Foundation, and we've asked them for further funding. And the government of Puerto Rico has stepped forward uh, with $100,000 to help us maybe come up with a prototype. Um, we know that's not a truly commercial model. Again, we'll keep it open source. Um, and and we're, we're thinking about how we can make this a priority as well. Robert, do you have any comments? Uh, can I show them some of my senior design work real quick? Yeah, please. So, um, Zayid, with, with that $100,000 you just applied for, um, Robert started down this path. Amazing. So, so, hope you guys get it solved at some point. And if not, I mean, oh, no, no, that doesn't work. Doesn't matter. Okay. Here we go. Here's a first render of it. So we're working on kind of, this is one of my side projects. If you don't know, I'm a, uh, still a senior in, a, in college. Um, and one of the things I'm working on is they kind of brought this up to me too. And so we're looking at kind of first steps on what it would take to make a full ecosystem for a user to be able to shred down plastic water bottles and then turn them into pellets. So we're trying to develop an ecosystem for that as well. So this is kind of just some really rough renderings of both the granulator setup as well as the um, the pellet extrusion setup. And so the pellet extrusion setup, we have a lot of parts on order as well as the granulator. We're doing final infinite life testing just to kind of see what we can get out of it. So. Yeah, amazing. Hope at some point you guys get the whole ecosystem all together. For um, Zaid and John, you know, one thing that will help us, particularly as we we try and make the petition for more funds to, to fund this research and, and the development, is um, maybe if you could share, like, what, you know, if, if those features such as a grinder or a dryer or a feeding mechanism was helpful for you, um, what, what the what the ideal price range might be for it. So, um, sorry, Gab, so there, there, was think about the there was there was some big noise and I couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So one thing that we struggle with is as we uh, um, you know either pitch or apply for grants, um, and and we're not the only one. So our friends doing similar things in Kenya and Aruba are thinking about this too. And and the question is. Um, how affordable does it have to be to be viable? So how much would you prefer to pay for a grinder or a dryer or a feeding system? So, you know, that helps us think about what we have to design towards. Regarding that, I don't know, because since we're starting a big manufacturing center that it's supposed to be an innovation center for the whole region, maybe the price point isn't that important for us as it will be for someone else because even if it's expensive we will 
find a way to get the funds and actually purchase it. And it goes a lot with our social strategy because since we gift uh, some prosthetic hands to people and it will be great like to do the two things at the same time, like like taking care of the ecosystem and trying to recycle the water bottles, for example, and then turning them into hands for people that are super powerful. And uh, okay. that, that's something that, that we want to do. So we will not care that much about it. Also, um, the Precious Plastic Project, I think they have uh, some sort of grinder design but the problem is that the materials that go with that design are very hard to get in mexico because they change a lot from europe from from here right we're, we're actually in touch with them I've, I've been pretty transparent in sharing our drawings so um we're, so we're trying have, to work with what they've done i think like if all of the add-ons will have a similar price point to the printer it makes sense for me. Okay. And then, um, John, I, I know this is all new to you and, and you'll have to digest it. Um, and then, Zayed, one of the other big considerations we're thinking about is, like, again, what material and how much volume because that would dictate the size requirements. Because there are grinders and dryers and feeding mechanisms available, but take, like, but typically they're for larger quantities. So we're trying to figure out, like, for Gigabot X, how much volume are you trying to push so we can – you know, work towards optimizing cost and scale for that. So regarding the the relations from the grinder to the dryer, I think the grinder you, you have more time like to grind them to the flake size you actually need. But regarding the dryer you actually have like as Robert said, you need to, to be drying lots of pellets at the same time. Because if you let some time like you cannot like dry them and then store them and then getting them back to the printer because even if you seal them in somewhere that's like um completely sealed and with silica bags and so forth it doesn't matter they always like change their behavior and you will need like to apply the adjustments to the printing profile and so so i think the the one that should be bigger should be actually the dehydrator and not the grinder in my opinion. That, that's super helpful. Thank you. No, Zaid, this is Matthew, by the way. I was able to jump on the call. Uh, you're absolutely spot on with the process requirements. And to that point, uh, we're investigating integrating the dryer right into the printer. So it dries <laughs> it just immediately before printing. That's super nice. That will be a game changer. Um, well, I, I really appreciate, you know, the feedback today. Matthew, did you have any questions for um, John and Saeed while they're on the call? And again, I, I suspect you might have a couple other participants in the next one. Um, after Matthew asks his questions, um, if you guys still have a couple minutes, I'd love to get some feedback on the timing for this call to make sure it's, it's good for you so we can Don't take worry. a good date and time going Don't forward. Time. Timing is good. So, so while I don't have any questions, I'll play catch up on the first part of the meeting. Uh, I am here for you if you have any questions for me. Thank you, Matthew. I think they all been already addressed. The thing that worries me the most is the mass center of the extruder. Who can it be moved to the center of the linear rail? Who maybe you could use some metal brackets in order to. Uh, move the mass center and also give it more stability and stuff like that. But uh, I think Robert already has other some of the issues. Yep. No, you're 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 a mechanical engineer, aren't you? <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly the design intent is to put the center of mass uh, appropriately so that we reduce the vibration and any uh, leverage. Uh, any torque that it would uh, present on the bearings. And we also integrated a double linear bearing system to increase the rigidity. So as with any, any machine tool, rigidity is number one. And that's why when you go into a machine shop, the best machines they have are the ones that are 
are heavy duty and massive uh, and, and, and reduces all the vibrations. Amazing. Um, well, let's get to know that this, the time works, which was um, 5 ET for Central going forward. Uh, we, we'd like to make this a monthly call. Does this does Wednesday work for you guys? Yes. Yeah, it's, cool. it's and then, Awesome. And then the one thing that I realized we didn't touch on that you're probably wondering is, you know, where we are in your build process. So Robert did a really great job explaining our, you know, design directions and the pivot, pivots and getting feedback on um, future features. Um, Matthew, do you want to highlight where we are as far as, like, delivery? And um, I, I, my understanding based on the, the operations calls is right now we're on time. Um, I, yep. Are there any other bottlenecks we should flag? The, uh, the timeline still stands. So the original timeline, we don't see any extension in the timeline. And the build process right now is we're on uh, the next uh, generation of machine. So uh, the initial uh, machine that you saw in, in videos and Kickstarter, uh, we are addressing uh, the robustness of it and making it even better as we do. That's what we love to do. And uh, we have the original machine, as, as was probably shared, with uh, Michigan Tech doing validation on all of the uh, results that we've collected to date. So we're getting a, a second party validation on the machine. And uh, the next generation one is coming together. I expect within the next two weeks, we'll be having results from the second machine. Um, and just some minor, minor points that we're addressing were uh, we initially started with uh, more 3D printed components, just because that's what we do. And we're replacing those with uh, aluminum. So just adding robustness to the machine. Uh, really excited about how it's looking so far. Sounds good. Yeah, and on my part, don't worry. I, I don't care that much about time. Take your time to do something that you like, that you're comfortable with, and that's fine with me. We already have actually our other bot to, to print our big pieces, so we're, we're fine. Take your time. Well, for sure, we're going to deliver a product that's uh, of the, the, the highest quality. So uh, anything that we put out is going to be the best product, uh, and no doubts about that. Thank you, Matthew. I know I'm, I'm pretty happy with my old one. <laughs> Um, well, that's great to hear. I'm glad that we got the two of you on. Again, any questions, please let us know. Robert um, will definitely follow up with the links to where you can find the design files if you want to get nerdy. You know, this is a product that you inspired and you will inform that hopefully will make a huge difference in the world. So we really want your feedback. Um, we want to make this a regular tag. And um, please know that if you ever find yourself in Houston, we want to give you an opportunity to, to tour the factory and meet the faces behind the scenes and um, and ask any questions that you have. Um, I know you're, you're spread out geographically, but, you know, we'll be thinking hard, too, about how we can visit you in the upcoming months um, to see your needs in person because we know that your feedback is hugely critical. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Samantha. It was really nice to hear back from you. Thank you. Great. Um, well, if, you have, if you don't have anything else, we'll, we'll jump off. And I'll give you a second to ask any last questions. Um, it's, it's really cool to connect both of you, and um, I can't wait for you to meet the other backers as well. Awesome. Well, I, I think that's it. Um, so we'll, we'll cut out the, the initial part of the, the recording with the comms issues, but um, we'll, we'll send it around. I know, John, you indicated you might want to listen to it a couple of times as, as you get informed on this space as well. And if there's um, future things you want us to share, please let us know. We can get as nerdy as you want to go. Thanks, thanks so much, guys. I appreciate uh, chatting with you even so briefly. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a great night. All right. Bye.